Hello everyone, I'm so excited for our topic today about credit cards and I'm so excited for our special guest, Sarah Rathner, who's gonna tell us more about credit cards. So just a little briefing before we get started. Um, I started this video because back when I was 18, I remember opening a credit card and having no idea what I was doing, what the credit card was, what all the financial lingo that they were throwing at me had to do with anything. All I cared about was basically how much money they were going to give me. And I can tell you guys now that I'm 30, it has had lots of repercussions, not just on my credit, but on so many other things. And I'm so glad that we have Sarah here to answer your questions, the questions that you guys send us. And I cannot wait to hear what she has to tell us. So First, Sarah, thank you so much again for joining us. I would love for you, for you to introduce yourself and just give us a, be, a brief background. Like, what do you do? Um, how did you become a credit card expert? And of course, like, what do you do for Nerd Wallet? Hi, it's nice to, uh, to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Sarah Rathner. I'm a credit cards expert and writer at Nerd Wallet. And I'm actually from Miami. I was born and raised there. I grew up in Kendall. Um, and now I live in Richmond, Virginia, which is very different. Like I have a fireplace, which is new. Um, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid of using it. So that's like very Miami. <laughs> um, very I don't know how to Miami. Uh, so I, um, I actually have a background in journalism. That's what I have my degree in. And so writing and graphic design and news design was what I really got my start in originally. But then I've worked in um, the FinTech industry or financial technology for most of my career. And I've been at NerdWallet now for almost two years. And that's a really interesting industry because um, you might have played around with different types of financial apps or online savings accounts, um, all sorts of things that can help you kind of navigate your finances from your phone wherever you are. And NerdWallet's no exception, we have an app too. And so this is a really interesting industry to get involved in, especially for me, because it was a great way to combine my writing background with my personal finance background. And um, so that's, that's basically how I got to where I am today. That's amazing. And what exactly do you do with NerdWallet? So I uh, write about credit cards, uh, travel, personal loans, different topics along those lines. I'm also, I also uh, am a spokesperson for NerdWallet as well. So I get to uh, be quoted in the media or be on television or be on video like this. Um, so uh, normally I, I talk a lot about different topics around the same thing. So credit cards, travel, because there are lots of travel rewards credit cards out there. So uh, those topics tend to be really intertwined and then also different types of debt repayment methods like personal loans and other ways that you can kind of manage your debt, consolidate it, pay it back as quickly as you can. Okay, wow, that's, that's fantastic. I feel like that is really helpful because especially with the travel credit cards, um, I use the travel credit card. I feel like it's so beneficial for students. Definitely something that they should look into as well. Um, so that's amazing. It's wonderful that there's somewhere that they can go to. And I'm sure we'll talk about more about how can they use Nerd Wallet to basically manage all of these different things. Um, but let's get right into the nitty gritty. Let's answer some of these questions. So our first question is, what is the difference between a credit card and a debit card? Well, they look identical, so it could be confusing, but they actually work in very different ways. A debit card is tied directly to your checking account. So when you go to an ATM to take money out or you use your debit card at a store to buy something, the money is automatically withdrawn from your checking account pretty much immediately. With a credit card, it's kind of like ringing up a tab. Um, you make purchases all month, and then at the end of the month, you get a bill from the credit card company, and you have a certain amount of time to pay that bill back. And you can choose to pay the entire bill back, which I advocate for because it keeps you out of credit card debt. Okay. But you can also pay a lesser amount as well and then carry the remaining balance into a future month and begin to pay interest on it. So basically, in student terms, a debit card is my money and a credit card is not my money. Yes? Well, a credit card is still your money because okay. you are basically promising that you'll pay it back in a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, and, and, and it becomes even more of your money if you get into credit card debt because credit cards have really high interest rates. And so if you 
you know, keep pushing debt forward and forward and continue spending, it grows exponentially. And that can, you know, really limit your options later on. Okay. Wow. Very good. Okay. And so how many credit cards should I, should I have? Now I know what a credit card is. I want to go and open a credit card. How many should I actually have in my wallet? Well, there's no right answer because it depends a lot on where you are in life and also um, how comfortable you feel managing just one credit card versus several credit cards at the same time. And so sometimes you might prefer the convenience of just one card to use for everything, one bill to pay every month. Other times you might want to have several credit cards because they earn rewards on different types of spending. And then you can maximize by choosing one card at the grocery store, one card at a restaurant, one card for Uber, things like that. Okay. Okay. So let's say that I'm a student. Do you recommend me having more than one card or should I have one or two cards? What do you think would be best? So that can depend on some of your different life circumstances. Some people are students who are also working and so they're, they're bringing in an income, especially if they're maybe a student part-time and working full-time. Um, you know, they might, if you were more established in life before you went to school, you might feel a little bit more comfortable managing one or more credit cards because you've already spent time managing many of your finances on your own already. But if you are kind of earlier in your adulthood, maybe a full-time student, perhaps not working right now, uh, not earning an income of your own, you really want to just kind of dip your toe in the water and go slow. And that way, a couple years from now, you'll feel really confident when it comes to managing your money. Okay. So even if, let's say, I didn't have a job, you would recommend, and maybe maybe mom and dad are just giving me some sort of allowance, you would recommend if you're still maybe getting out of high school or, you know, just starting college, open up a credit card and maybe just use that allowance to kind of start your credit? Is that something that you would recommend? You could potentially do that. There are a couple things to keep in mind, especially if you're under 21. Okay. Because if you're under 21, I do believe you need a source of income, okay. uh, independent income to qualify for credit cards. Gotcha. Uh, if you're over 21, you have some more options. Um, and that was something that was started after the recession around 2009, uh, just as a way to protect younger consumers from uh, credit card company practices that were considered predatory. So there, when you're a student, there are some issues to keep in mind that just have to do with your age. Um, beyond that, uh, one thing that, that students can do when they're just getting started, if they don't necessarily have income on their own, is become an authorized user on one of their parents' credit cards. Okay. And that kind of allows you to um, use, you know, kind of use your parents' good credit behaviors to your advantage because they're good uh, actions like making on-time payments, you know, staying out of debt, that can help you build your own credit history. Oh, wow. Uh, but just keep in mind, you want to become an authorized user of somebody who has treated their credit cards responsibly because just like their positive actions can benefit you, their negative actions can hurt you. Okay. I see. Wow. That's really interesting. That's great. Okay. Now, is it more recommendable to open the account online or to go in person to the bank? It honestly doesn't matter. It's very rare for a bank to have some sort of promotion where you have to go in in person to apply for a credit card. Honestly, doing it online is so much more convenient. You can do this 24 hours a day from your computer or your phone. But I would just recommend make sure that you are on a secured Wi-Fi network when you apply because you're providing a lot of really sensitive personal information when you apply for a credit card, like your social security number, sometimes your mother's maiden name, your birthday, your income. You don't want strangers who have bad intentions to get this information. So do it from home, from a password protected Wi-Fi. Don't do this in a coffee shop where somebody could look over your shoulder or hack into the Wi-Fi. Okay. Oh, that's a great answer. Very good. Now, what's the most effective way to build credit? What would you say? The biggest thing you can do is pay your credit card bills and other bills and other debt payments on time every month. You probably owe what's called a minimum payment. Uh, you can make at least the minimum payment. It might get you into debt with credit cards, but at least it will keep your account in good standing and that can help you build credit. This also includes cell phone bills, utility bills like electricity and gas. And it can even include your rent payment in some cases because a lot of these bills are reported to credit bureaus. Oh, wow. So it's not just your credit cards that are being reported, but it's everything else too that's like actually implicating into your credit card score, I mean, to your credit score. Right. Yeah, and a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of your students might have student loans. 
Yeah. And that's often how young adults begin to build credit for the first time, even before they get a credit card of their own. Oh. So make your student loan payments on time every month. Wow. Yeah, definitely. I I'm, have student loans. Make your payments on time. I'm telling you, you guys won't regret it. Feels really, it feels so good when you get that letter in the mail that says that you finished paying them. It's <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Honestly, I can't wait for my letter to come, but I cannot it, even It'll be the best day. <laughs> You'll feel so free. <laughs> imagine, but it's so true because it's such a huge impact on your credit if you just miss one payment of your student loan. I mean, it's yeah, one. Great. Late payments like that can drop your credit score by around 100 points, which is huge. And it can take a while to recover from that. It's just like grades, guys, right? If you get an A+, plus, great. But recovering from that zero, ooh, terrible. Right? It's actually exactly. Great, great That's exactly. It's, it's kind of like a GPA for your finances. It's re it really is. It's like the GPA of your finances. But I feel like it has so many more implications because it means buying a house, being able to have a car. Like there are so many things that are tied to your credit that you don't think about when you're a student or when maybe when you're a young adult and then everything else is just tied into that one number, you know, and you think right. that's one number. And it's not just qualifying for a loan, like a, a car loan or a mortgage. It's about, I mean, you can qualify for these types of loans with, um, in some cases, lower credit scores, but you'll probably have to pay a higher interest rate on them because the lenders consider you a little bit riskier to lend money to. And so, you know, it feels good because you can still get the house, but at the same time, you know, a mortgage is 15 to 30 years. That interest compounds over a long period of time. You can save tens of thousands of dollars on a, a large loan like a mortgage if you have excellent credit and you can qualify for the lowest interest rate available. So it's, it's not just about qualifying, it's about saving money on debt over the course of your entire life. That's amazing. I didn't even know like one thing correlated with the other. I thought just everyone was like, oh, okay, here's the interest rate for everybody. I didn't yeah, have to no. Yeah, so interest rates are interesting because there's usually a range uh, and, um, you can, qual you know, when, when you have excellent credit, you have a, a very, um, you know, solid financial history because you've taken actions to keep your credit safe over time, you get rewarded in a way because lenders view you as responsible. And if you are responsible in their eyes, they are going to give you better loan terms than they would with somebody who maybe has had some negative marks on their credit in the past. So, you know, really, like when I say it's like a GPA, it's kind of like, you know, if, if you have a good GPA in high school, you're more likely to get into college. And if you have a good GPA in college, you're more likely to get into grad school. It's kind of like having a good credit score in life makes you more likely to get a good mortgage, a good car loan, um, and, and other credit cards that have better rewards programs too. Right. Yeah. Wow. That's, I love how like you have phrased that because it's so important for that, those correlations. I think that's what really matters to students. Cause when you hear these big words, sometimes you're like, but then you put it into ways that they can understand it and they can really focus and see, okay, wait, if it's more like my GPA, I understand now it's like all these other implications that it could have. So I really love that you can make it easier for them to understand. Now, yeah, another, one thing I'll say, oh, oh, sorry, like, I, I think it's sort of important to know, um, I don't think something I realized when I was younger that I realize now is so many big life choices are actually financial decisions. So they're all intertwined together when you pick a car, when you pick a house, but even when you decide what city to move to, because, you know, when you're weighing a job offer, even, you know, deciding to get married and plan a wedding, these are all emotional decisions and professional decisions, but they're also financial decisions. And so that's, yeah, so that, that, that's something that's going to happen to you every year <laughs> in your life. I, I completely agree because, you know, even when you say, you know, how it imp like implicates different things, it's so true. Like when you think about it, like your wedding is with money. Yeah, it's a beautiful day, but how much can you spend on that particular day, you know? And all those things lead back to like, what decisions have you made 10 years ago? You know, like when you were a student, because are you in debt now that like you're 30 and want to get married? And it just, it really does kind of have like a domino effect kind of. So it's really yeah. interesting. I love how you really yeah. have put it in like a really easy, simple way. Yeah. And it's not to scare anybody because, you know, sometimes people, everybody makes financial mistakes and, and what's important is what you do next to uh, kind of fix the mistake and, and learn from it. 
and do differently next time. So it's, it's totally fine and totally normal to do something and then backtrack. Um, but just realize like how money plays a role in all these different areas of your life. It's true. Definitely. I completely, completely agree. Now, the next question that they had was, should I pay my card in full every month or let it gain interest? So there is this myth that I, I don't like, <laughs> that you can improve your credit score by leaving a small balance on your credit card every month and then paying a little bit of interest on it. No, That's a dangerous no, myth. Yeah, because I've, I've heard that from so many people who are like, oh yeah, my, my grandmother told me that or my, my neighbor told me that. And so I leave like 30 bucks in debt on my credit card every month and pay interest on it. There's no reason to do that because you can improve your credit for free if you pay your bill in full on time every month. And a big part of that is being careful when you use your card and not charging more than you could afford to pay back. Okay. So do, would you recommend having like a sort of budget in terms of like, okay, I can only spend this much. So I will like create it like a budget for yourself. Is that the best way? Yeah, budgeting is a really useful exercise. It really helps you. I know it feels like homework and a lot of people don't love the idea of budgeting, but it helps you feel kind of free because you know that um, every dollar you have is going to go to work for you in some way. You know, this amount of money goes to your rent, this amount of money goes to your other bills, and you know exactly how much you have left every month for fun stuff. Yeah. And you can do that fun stuff knowing that you've met all of your other obligations and now you are free to, you know, buy concert tickets or buy plane tickets or go out to eat without worrying about getting into debt. Yeah, I completely agree. Okay, now the next question is, which is the best way to close a credit card once you realized you made the wrong choice? Yeah, so closing credit cards is definitely something you can do, but it's something that you want to do thoughtfully and carefully because it can have an effect on your credit score. So if it's a credit card that you haven't held for very long, you applied, you got accepted, and then you suddenly realize this is not for me, it can affect your credit because every time you apply for a card, there's what's called a hard credit inquiry. That's when a bank kind of investigates your credit history. Right. And that usually lowers your credit score temporarily by a couple of points. So that's something to keep in mind if maybe you were planning on applying for a car loan or mortgage in a couple months, you want your credit score as high as possible. So you don't want all of those inquiries on your record for the last like six months or so. If it's a card you've held for a longer time, maybe a couple of years, um, it can affect your credit in slightly different ways than that. Okay. Uh, one thing is, um, one factor that goes into calculating your credit score is the average age of all of your accounts. And so if you have a credit card that you've had open for like five years and you close it, that can lower the average age of your accounts in total. And it could also lower your total credit limit because closing one card means you have one less account with credit limit. And we usually recommend you don't charge more than 30% of your total credit limit every month. That's called your credit utilization ratio. That's a little financial term for you. Yeah, um, okay, I like that. Yeah. 30% of your, okay, of your credit. Okay, perfect. Right. So if you close a credit card that has a high credit limit, but you don't change your spending and, or you don't apply for another card to take its place, right. then you run the risk of kind of maxing out your credit cards more easily. And that can also negatively affect your score over time. I see. That's so interesting. And but closing the card itself, like calling the bank, or I, I've I've never closed a card, so I'm not sure. But if you like, I guess you call. I don't know how you do it, but whatever it is that you do, I mean, does that affect it itself? Like that action of closing it, does the does your credit score realize? Okay, this card has been closed, and maybe I don't know. We drop you ten points. Let's say. Yeah. So to close a card, you would call. You can't do it online. You have to speak okay. to a person. They. Um, you know, they, they, sometimes they might offer you incentives to stay, depending on the reason that you're canceling, they'll ask you why. And okay. if you decide to go through with it, they'll read some legal information that they are required to read to you. And then they will say, okay, your card is closed. And if you, um, you would, you know, pay off any unpaid balance on it, or um, if they like had to refund your money, let's say they refunded an annual fee, they might send you a check as a reimbursement for that money because okay. the account is no longer open. So that's essentially the process. It, it, it doesn't take very long. It just depends on how long you have to sit on hold to, to get to a person. Exactly. That's really the way. 
Right. And once you do, the credit, credit bureaus will recognize that your account is closed. And um, if there's any effect on your credit score, it, it'll happen pretty quickly. I actually, I use the NerdWallet app to keep track of my credit. And it tells me pretty quickly when maybe there's been a credit inquiry on my account because I've applied for a new credit card. Uh, and it also knows which credit cards I have. So that's a way for me to sort of keep track of the effect that these sorts of actions have on my credit. That's that's great. I have actually not really like played around with NerdWallet yet. And I'm so excited for you to tell me so much more so I could download it and I could go ahead and use it because anything that could make my life easier and could just like have all my information in one place for me is like the best tool. Cause it is just so daunting to have to be going to different apps, different websites, like looking for my credit score, looking for this. So that's, I'm so excited for you to tell me more about how this all works. Now, I think the next question I have was, um, let me see, which is the best way, oh no, what happens if I, don't, if I do not use my credit card for a long period of time? So I didn't use it for a long time. Right, so that, if, if your credit card is inactive for a long period of time, some credit card companies will actually close the card for you. So yeah, and, and if you wanted to keep it open, that, that can be a real problem. What you can do is, Use the card maybe two or three times a year. You can leave it in a drawer. You don't have to carry it, but just use it on a couple of things and then pay the bill off in full. Uh, another thing I recommend is maybe put one small recurring charge on it every month, like a streaming service subscription, something like, you know, five to $15, put it on auto pay. So it like, you know, the money comes out of your checking account at the right time. You never go into credit card debt. You never have a late payment. And that keeps the card active, uh, but you know, you don't have to carry it around with you. That's such a good idea. That is the best idea. I love that idea. What tips do you recommend when you're looking for a credit card to apply for? So I'm looking for a card. Do I go on your wallet and you guys have options for me? How do I find the right card for me? It's really important to shop around. Okay. You know, friends and family members might recommend different cards to you that they have really liked, but their financial situation might be different. And so what works for them might not work for you. So NerdWallet really is helpful with this because um, with the app, you can see what your credit score is. So you know what range you fall into and that can affect what types of cards you qualify for. And then ask yourself, you know, what types of terms do I want? Do I want a card that pays me like cash back? Do I want a travel card? Do I want a card with no annual fee? And when you have all the answers to these questions, suddenly, out of thousands of credit cards, you only have maybe five or 10 to choose from. And that makes the decision so much easier. Do you recommend a particular kind of card? Like, do you lean towards something? Like, do you lean towards using travel cards or rewards cards? Is there something that you recommend particularly? So it depends on your financial situation, what you qualify for, and what you can really manage, and sort of your purpose in taking out the card. I. I try to get rewards cards whenever I can, at least cash back, if not travel. I've had both. Um, I have traveled the world on credit card points. So uh, that's been very helpful for me. Obviously right now I'm not really traveling much, so I'm using cash back. But I would say if you qualify and if the card really fits what you're looking for, at least cash back rewards are great because that's like using a coupon every time you shop. Yeah. Yeah, I know because I've had those kind of cards where they're like giving you money back if you spend a certain amount and it's fantastic to like, it's like a free prize. It's so wonderful. Like I get something in return. So yeah, I definitely, and I love travel cards. Uh, we have a travel card and we have used it on so many different flights and it's just a perk to be able to like go online and not have to pay for the flight. So I think that part is really good, but I do know that it depends on what kind of credit score you have, if you can get one of those cards. So I know there's right. rules. Yeah. And I will say this, if you um, take on credit card debt or you think you might take on credit card debt, rewards cards sort of become a moot point because the interest that you would pay on your debt would far offset the value of the rewards you would get. So I would be really careful. You know, don't think of rewards as free money. It's merely a reimbursement for money that you've already spent. So you still need to be careful with your spending. Yeah. Um, because it can get, it can, 
you know, it, it can be so easy to justify spending, oh, well, I get 2% back, so it's okay. It's not actually that much money. So yeah. you still need to be cautious. That's true. Yeah. I think that that's the biggest thing probably with credit cards is just being cautious and not spending more than you can handle, than you could spend. Definitely. I think that that whole idea of, you know, if it's, you know, set yourself up for something that you could pay in full for that month. And then that's the best way I would say, right? Just kind of pay as much as you can. Don't take on too much than you can handle. Right. And you don't have to pay for everything with a credit card. What you can do when you're first starting out is use a debit card or cash for some expenses, just so you're going straight from your checking account. And then maybe use your credit card for one or two do bills or expenses a month and then pay that off in full. And that way you can build a positive credit history when you're first starting out, but you're not running the risk of charging more than you can afford. So maybe just put your cell phone bill on your credit card, something like that. Yeah, something small. Yeah, I like that. Very good. What about, they have another question here. They say, how do I make sure I don't fall behind on my payments? There are a couple ways to do that. I really love setting up email and text alerts on my credit card accounts, because then I don't have to memorize when the due dates are. You just get an email or a text maybe 10 days or so before your bill is due. And that way you can log into your account and pay it the moment you get that email. Um, you can also set up auto pay, which is where it will automatically whisk the money out of your checking account and pay the bill. And you can set it up to either make the minimum payment or pay what's on the statement balance or some other custom amount. And that way, you know that your bill is always going to be paid on time. You're never going to owe money for late payments. But you want to make sure that you always have enough money in your checking account to cover your credit card bill. Because while you might avoid fees on the credit card side, if you overdraft your account, then you'll have to pay fees on your bank account. Right. Yeah. Wow. I actually really didn't even know that you could set a specific amount. Like I knew you could auto pay your minimum payment, but I didn't know you could auto pay your statement balance. Like whatever the whole balance was for, you know, cause since it changes, you might use a hundred dollars this month and then 200. I thought it was like, you could set up your minimum payment, but I had no idea you could do the whole balance. Yeah. And you can, you can even decide which date you want to pay. So you can line it up with your paychecks if you work. And um, you can also change your credit card due date. So it lines up with your paycheck. So if you get paid on the 15th and 30th every month, maybe you pay your credit card bill on the 16th right after your first paycheck comes in. And then you pay your rent on the first of the month right after your paycheck comes in the day before. So you can line up all of your different bills so you know you have the money in your bank account. That's awesome. So do you have to call to do this or do I do this on the Nerd Wallet? website like how do i get all of this aligned so that they you know can set me up with this it depends on the credit card you can either do it through went on your credit card account by logging in at the bank okay. or sometimes in some cases you might it might be easier to call so it would depend on the card i would say try doing it online first okay. because that's faster and if that doesn't work if that's not an option then call okay awesome all right now the next question is how is apr calculated yeah, so APR's annual percentage rate, um, put another way, that's the interest that you'll pay on your credit card. Not everybody okay. knows what that acronym means, but um, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's done through more of what's called an average daily balance. So there's a little bit of math involved. APR is divided by 365 to get the daily interest rate. And then that's multiplied by the average balance you carry every day in the course of a billing cycle. So it's a little bit complicated. Okay, um, that's complicated. It's actually not necessarily, it's, it's not really necessary to know exactly how interest is calculated okay. in order to manage your card. Really what's important is, you know, paying your bills on time, trying to stay out of credit card debt or trying to pay down the debt you already have. Can you kind of negotiate your interest? You can, you can negotiate probably a lot more than you think when it comes to your credit cards. And it doesn't hurt to ask because okay. the worst you can get is a no. But you have a lot more power in the situation if you're a responsible user of your credit card. That's another incentive to you know, stay out of debt, pay your bills on time, because when it comes time to negotiate, you know, you, you've already shown that you're a responsible person and they're more likely to grant you at least some of what you're asking for. That's fantastic. So again, do you have to call so that you could kind of negotiate this out with someone? Yes, call and talk to a person and see what you can do. And you know, it, you can always vote, I call it voting with your wallet. If a card is not really working for you, but a little bit of a negotiation would make it work, then try. But if it's really not a good product for you, then that's the sign that 
you should shop around and look for something else. And that's another, again, another reason to work on building a positive credit history, getting good to excellent credit scores, because again, if negotiating doesn't work, suddenly you have so many more other credit card options available to you instead. Wow. Okay. Now, great questions that I have about Nerd Wallet, which is, I'm so excited to know more, is how can Nerd Wallet help me? How can they help our students? What can we do with Nerd Wallet? So you can use Nerd Wallet in a couple ways. Um, okay. Like I said, we have an app and that's a bit more personalized because you can, uh, it can tell you your credit score. It can even give you your credit report. So you can, if your credit score drops for any reason, you can get an explanation as to what happened. And you can also manage credit card and bank accounts and even other types of financial accounts. I have my mortgage on my app, so that's a scary large number that I owe. <laughs> um, so you can, you can kind of see how your finances change over time. And you can even get recommendations for different types of bank accounts or credit cards that would best fit your situation. And then on our website, we have different types of comparison tools and calculators that are really helpful and plenty of really helpful, really informative content about all different types of financial accounts and other concerns that you can turn to when you have a question. And, you know, I know you've mentioned, Sarah, being on a, like a secure network. When we use these kinds of apps like Nerd Wallet, do you recommend that we're also home and that we're not opening like Nerd Wallet in like Publix, you know, or in Whole Foods? I know there's no Publix up north, so I'll say Whole Foods. Actually, we have Publix here, which I'm really No happy. way! You have a Publix? <laughs> yeah, they're in Richmond, yeah. No way! That and is they sell my turbo, which makes me very I happy. I thought they only went <laughs> as high as them to Georgia. No, they, they are as high as Southern Virginia or Central Virginia. That's fantastic. Well, go public. Yeah. Yay. Well, taking yeah. over the world. <laughs> we really are shopping is a pleasure. Um, so, um, yeah, so the NerdWallet app uses the same type of security that you would see with other types of banking apps. So when you give your personal information, it is done in a secure way. So that's okay. really helpful to know. But I would always say, you know, when you're looking at your NerdWallet app or if you're logged into like your credit card or bank app, there is personal information on there, like your credit score, uh, you know, the, the, the totals that you might have in your account. So I would take serious caution when opening up these kinds of things in public because you never know who's looking over your shoulder. Uh, I can give you an example. Um, it wasn't an app, but I was on a long flight. And sometimes when they're, they're like airline cards get advertised on right. planes and then the flight attendants will hand out applications to the cards. The woman across the aisle from me filled out an application and then just left it on the tray table for four hours. And I could read her social security number from my seat. Not that I was going to do anything with it. Of course. But, <laughs> you know, that's just an example of, you know, you really want to protect your personal information. Whoa. And I'm actually shocked that they still allow people to kind of write all that information on a plane and kind of just hand it to a stewardess that you don't know because, I mean, you don't know them. I I'm not accusing, again, anyone of anything. I know that those women have had their jobs for a long time. But again, it's someone that you're handing a piece of paper to that could get lost, let's say. You know, yeah, like, ends I've, up in the I've heard of that happening. Yeah, I've heard of these applications getting lost. So that's something I would caution against. They sometimes offer these really enticing deals like, oh, you'll get a really big sign-up bonus if you do it on the flight. But honestly, it's not often a different sign-up bonus than you would get at home on your own computer on your secured Wi-Fi network. So wait till you get home to apply for those types of cards. Could you call and say, like, I heard this deal on the plane. Like, would you guys honor it if I did it now? Like, I didn't feel secure about, like, giving my information out on the airplane. Like, do you think that they would do that? Yeah, you could certainly try. I mean, I don't, you know, they might say yes. And then you've saved yourself from potentially somebody stealing your information because they were staring at your application while you were writing it out on a plane. So or they just definitely left it. what if you just, you know, like, like you said, if she just left it out there, you know, anyone could have just grabbed the paper. It's that, that to me is just so risky. I've never, anytime I've been handed something on a plane, I'm just like, no, thanks. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I want to have my if it's not a snack, I don't want it. <laughs> on those extra points, you know? Um, and then my last question, because this has been amazing. I have learned so much. I know the students are probably going to learn so, so much. I'm so excited. But my last question is, what is the biggest piece of advice that you could offer students? Like, what would you say their, the biggest takeaway would be from this whole thing? Ooh, I have to pick just one thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can make it whatever you want. It could be anything. Oh, wow. Is it something that they could like take from this and like, you know, 
what would be really important for them to like kind of like you know if they didn't watch this and they just skipped all the way to the end and like saw us say goodbye like what do they really need to take away from all of this you know a lot of successfully managing your personal finances is it's not exciting <laughs> you know it's not it's not sexy it's it's you know and so there are so many trends in finance you know hot investments and you know, really trendy credit cards that have all these like enticing uh, offers and they're not necessarily the best products for you and they're not necessarily the best investments for you. Personal finance is personal. That's why it's in the name. And what works for you is not going to work for your friends. So anytime, you know, you, you want to find trusted sources of advice and do your own research and think for yourself when it comes to things like this, because really managing your money is it's it's the same as any other errand it's it's not you know I, I check my bank accounts i pay my bills you know i put money into my 401k it's it's not like this nobody throws a party for me every time i do that you know so it's so true. and i would just say like but just because it's not super fun and exciting doesn't mean it's not important it's actually extremely important to you know you're doing yourself a favor that will benefit you for the rest of your life and will benefit your family if you pay attention to your finances and you know get good advice take up that advice and and save invest stay out of debt if you can um you know these are these are all really foundational things that people can do and i think it's great when you start really young because that gives you the gift of time it gives you time to make mistakes. It gives you time to save. It gives you time for your investments and savings to grow. The things that you do today when you're 21, 25 years old, you know, 10 years from now, you're going to see a huge difference in your finances. You're going to be so glad that you paid attention and you made deliberate choices. Um, it's, it's really going, it really it is doing, it's, it's giving a gift to yourself, to your future self. Yeah. Um, agree. Yeah. I have to come, I feel like I've made so many bad choices, guys. Make good choices because they do catch up. And I think that you don't realize it when you're 18. You're like, oh, it's just a little debt. Like, it'll go away. I'm only 18. And it kind of trails behind you in every single thing that you do. And again, being 18 and going to Miami Dade and like starting college, you feel like it's so much fun. Like I'm going to go out there. I'm going to have a lot of fun. I'm going to use my credit card. I'm going to go to the bar, buy a few drinks. But then afterwards, those drinks do add up and your credit card becomes debt and that debt becomes student loan debt added onto it. And little by little, when you want to buy a house, like we were saying, when you want to get married, you know, there's all these other things that you have to take care of first that you didn't even think you would have to have taken care of 18 when you were 18 because you weren't worried yeah. about it, you know? Yeah, and think about all the things that you want to do in your 20s and 30s and 40s and beyond. You know, do you want to have children? Do you want to travel? Do you want to buy a house? Um, do you want, you know, are you going to need to support somebody in your family financially, like your parents or your grandparents? You know, you need to budget for all of these different things. And the more choices you give yourself by being financially responsible when you're young, the easier it is to do all these things that you want to do and that you need to do when you're older. Life does get a little bit more complicated as you age, but you know, when you set a good, like a good foundation for yourself when you're young, you can manage all these things with so much more confidence when you're older. I agree. I completely agree. Especially like, I remember, I talk about this all the time. I remember used to be like being a kid or like even being 17 and wishing I was 21. And then when I was 21, wishing that I was 25. And it's now that I'm 30, I'm like, please God, just take me back to seven years old. I'll be good with that, you know? And we just don't realize all the things that in the moment we should really be considering and like thinking about it and taking, taking into consideration because time flies by so fast and I didn't see it before as again as I see it now like now I'm like how is it almost January again it's gonna be my birthday and then I'll be 31 no 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 like it just flies by you know so I completely agree guys make sure that you understand that everything that you do has implications right just like if you were to make a bad decision about something right and you end up going to jail or something of the sort it would be the same thing with our credit. You have implications that it has. If you don't take care of it, if you don't treat it right, like Sarah was saying, it's like your GPA, right? And 
like I said, if you get a zero on an exam, getting that GPA to go back up, getting your score to go back up is incredibly difficult. A credit score, and I should know, this has happened to me, is the same way. It's taken me years to recover my score, to like bring my score back up to like what it is now. And you shouldn't have to go through that if you know the right tools. If you have things like Nerd Wallet that I didn't have back when I was 18, right? If you have all of these tools, I know that you guys can be successful and you guys can make your credit score be something positive, something that you're looking forward to, not something that you're dreading to talk about, right? So with that being said, thank you, Sarah, so, so much. I learned so much. I am so happy that you joined us today because so many questions you answered that I had no idea, like, even about. So thank you so much. I, I was amazed by you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was great.